Hello, hello everyone, it's Martin, aka Anders, and today I'm bringing you the Computing Competitive episode for the T1X NSG Showdown. This event was by a very large margin the most serious event that North American Valorant and arguably the world has seen thus far, and so I'm really excited to get into the nitty gritty of it and taking a look at what agents were played, what compositions were played, the typical stuff. Without further ado, let's hop right in. Realistically, it needs no introduction, but I'll touch on some high-level points. The T1X NSG Showdown was easily the largest competition North America has seen thus far with a $50,000 prize pool. It included 16 teams competing in a group stage and then an elimination bracket with all of the major North American orgs you would expect to be present. T1, Gen G, Immortals, Sentinels, TSM, Cloud9, all of the regular faces, including the two brand new rosters for both 100 Thieves and FaZe Clan. In addition to those North American Hallmark orgs, we saw two qualifiers for this event that led in a couple of the Pro-Am teams that I'm super familiar with. Those teams were Together We Are Terrific, Prospects, Spot Up, and Echo 8. Spoilers incoming, so skip ahead now if you're interested in watching this in hindsight, but the event ended in what most people expected, with TSM and T1 duking it out not only in the upper bracket final, but in the grand final as well with TSM ultimately taking the win 3-0 in the grand final. Jumping right into the stats of the event, we'll start with map play rates. There's something really interesting here in that Ascent took the top slot despite being the newest map that we have access to. It not only knocked Bind out of the top position, but almost completely yoinked Bind's spot and switched places with it, knocking it to third. The map play rates overall were Ascent at 32%, Bind at 24.5%, Haven at just shy of 31%, and Split at just shy of 13%. Diving into Agent play rates, we see quite a few aberrations from what we've seen in past events. Per my usual layout, we have here the play rates for the agents within this competition versus their play rates in the overall meta. First off, the elephant in the room is that Sage wasn't the highest played agent in this competition. For the first time ever, Cypher came in ahead of her, and not only that, by a full 4.5%. This is right around a full 8% above Cypher's normal meta presence, but is very strongly indicative of his irreplaceable character design and unique utility. Next up we have Sage, who saw around a 3% dip from her normal meta presence, still very high in the lower 90s, but dropping from what we've expected from her in the past. Next up we have Brimstone, more or less where we would normally expect him, slotting in at 3rd with around a 75% play rate. Coming in the 4th slot is where things start getting really crazy. We see Sova with an almost 20% increase in meta presence from what we see on a global basis. I've been singing Sova's praises from very early on in Valorant's release, but I think people are very much so starting to attach to the agent and understand the upper skill ceiling that exists behind all of his lineups. Not only that, but I think this is a really strong indicator when coupled with Cypher that people are starting to lean more and more into Intel, which if you know anything about the history of Rainbow Six Siege's competitive ecosystem, is something that is absolutely expected. In that game, Intel metas have developed time and time again, and I expect that we'll see something similar develop, at the very least in the intermediate stages of Valorant's competitive scene. Next up we have another agent who I've been singing the praises of for a very long time, and that's Omen, who saw a 12% increase in overall meta presence, coming in at just under 38%. I've said for a long time now that Omen is a really strong alternative to Brimstone, and I'm kinda gonna throw that out the window. I don't think he's a good alternative to Brimstone anymore. I think he's outright better than Brimstone in 90% or more of scenarios. He's no longer just a sub-in for Brimstone where he gets to play the controller role. He now gets to play two roles simultaneously where he gets to have those smokes that you expect out of a controller, but also has access to what is now one of the better entry utilities in the game. I think that the only scenarios where you can sanely pick Brimstone over Omen at this point is when you're already front-loaded with entry utility and you for whatever reason really want Brimstone's molly. Next up we have Raze, who actually saw a roughly 13% drop in her overall presence. 
If you've been watching my recent meta analyses, you know that we've seen her dropping relatively poor win rates in the 48 to 50% range, which is lower than what we've seen from her in previous patches. That said though, I think that in North America in particular, her having a lower play rate is definitely not surprising because historically the region hasn't been overtly successful with her. Next up we have Breach, who's actually going the opposite direction of where I've been expecting him to go in the recent weeks. He drops 10% from his overall meta presence to roughly 27% during this competition. I still think that Breach is the best entry in the game, although that comes with a very strong caveat now. I think Breach is the best pure entry in the game. All of his utility is around playing entry or playing retake. Comparatively, however, I think Omen is a better quote-unquote entry now in that he can play entry but brings more to the table. That said, I don't think that Omen is the reason that Breach saw a significant decrease in play. Next up though, we have Phoenix, who definitely is why Breach had such a significant decrease in play. We see Phoenix jumping 10%, mirroring almost the exact same decrease that we saw with Breach. Phoenix has a couple interesting things going for him that I think are ultimately driving this play rate, two of the major of which being his ability to heal himself and his flashes being so flexible that he is very strong on the fly and as a self-sufficient agent. That self-sufficiency really shines in a particular composition that we'll get into later. After Phoenix, we have Jet, who, despite her immense success in recent weeks, comes in at only 24% play rate. After Jet, we have Reyna, who at long last is finally dropping to the play rates I think is more deserving of her agent design, having to almost 17%. Then last, we have Viper, which I don't think is going to surprise anybody. Despite her brand new buffs, she hasn't been integrated into compositions or executes yet by teams. If this is still 1.3% in the next major North American competition, we're hopeless. Straight up. We, we need to figure out how to make this agent work. She is insane. Trust me. Moving into win rates, you see exactly what I'm getting at. We have Viper literally top of the food chain at almost 54% win rate. Obviously, because of how little she was played, there's going to be significant skew in this, but I'm almost over putting that disclaimer on this. How many times do we have to see Viper as the highest win rate agent, or at least in the top three, before we just establish that at a baseline, she deserves to be where she's at? If she's only played a small amount, but sees a high win rate, and then she does the same thing the next week, and then she does the same thing the next week, and the next week, at what point do we stop putting a disclaimer on it and say, yeah, okay, in aggregate, it actually just makes sense at this point that she is that good. With how much I talk about this, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir at this point. At this stage, I'm taking bets. How long is it going to take for teams to figure out how insane Viper is? Right below her, in another hilarious contradiction, we have Breach, the entry who's seeing a huge drop in play rate at just shy of 52% win. The recent abandonment of Breach makes absolutely no sense to me. Nothing about his kit has changed, he is still the best retake agent in the game as far as I'm concerned. If you are taking an entry who doesn't explicitly need to fill additional criteria such as self-sufficiency or additional utility for executes, there is no conceivable universe where you should not be playing Breach. Plain and simple. After Breach, we have Omen, who I've ranted about plenty. He comes in at just shy of 51% win rate, and is deservedly so. Next up, we have Cypher, coming in at 50.6%, which is completely understandable. Brimstone and Sage floating around the 50%, which we typically expect from them. An interesting one, however, is when we get down to Sova. It's not interesting in that it's particularly skewed in either direction, it's interesting because Sova's huge increase in play rate to where he got into the 70s during this competition puts him in the same arena as the Cypher Brimstone Sages of the world, where he's now going to baseline at around 50%. After Sova, we have Phoenix coming in just shy of 50%. I think that this is super interesting because Phoenix honestly should have an inflated win rate here. He was played so much by TSM, who ended up winning the competition, that him being sub-50 means that basically everyone who played Phoenix that wasn't TSM was getting absolutely annihilated. Next up we have Jet, who follows a very similar pattern in that she was played pretty significantly by high caliber teams like TSM and Cloud9, so I'd expect her win rate to be quite a bit higher. 
The fact that it isn't means that the majority of teams that were playing her outside of those juggernaut organizations were just not finding success. After Jet we have Raze, seeing an even further decrease in her win rate from the overall meta, which honestly already wasn't that great. I don't know what it's going to take for North America to be able to find success on this agent, but y'all got to start watching some EU tourneys, I guess, because the comparative success is, is borderline comical at this point. Coming in way at the bottom, where I expect her to be, we have Reyna, who barely breaks 46% win. Now that we've got the general baseline of both play rates and win rates for agents, let's take a quick look at compositions. Taking a look at the top 5 compositions played at the tournament, none of these are faces we didn't expect to see necessarily. The top slot was taken by Shockinaw plus Cypher, the second slot was taken by Common Core plus Sova, the third slot was taken by Common Core plus Sova with an Omen sub for Brimstone, the fourth slot was taken by Molten Core plus Sova, and really the only oddball was coming in at fifth. The comp is extremely odd. It uses the standard core of Brimstone Cypher Sage and then fills its other two slots with just the two greediest agents they could get their hands on. You've got a greedy rifler in Reyna, and you've got a greedy opper in Jet. Looking at this comp, I would expect to see it more in solo queue than in a tournament, and so I was super interested to see which teams in particular were playing it. And after seeing who it was, it actually makes a little bit more sense. The three teams that were playing it were Cloud9, Together We Are Terrific, and Code 7. So Cloud9, a team that doesn't have a full 5 stack roster yet, but has an established superstar of a player in 10s, and two Pro-Am teams who are honestly used to being able to run through their entire brackets based almost entirely on gun skill and raw superiority. And so the fact that those teams would be willing to rely on compositions that are so heavily reliant on pop-off individual performances isn't all that surprising. I would never in a million years call this an ideal playstyle to take into a tournament, but based off of the type of teams that they are, this is their home, this is what they're used to, and makes a lot of sense that they would pull this out. Taking a look at the stats of these compositions, you have that Shock and Awe plus Cypher comp making up almost 21% of the meta with roughly 52% win rate. You have the Common Core plus Sova comp coming in at around 10% of the meadow with a flat 50% win rate. You had that Common Core plus Sova with the Omen sub coming in at just shy of 8% play rate and 54% win, which is rather impressive. Then you have that Molten Core plus Sova composition coming in at a 7% play rate and an extremely disappointing sub 45% win rate. And last, we have that Oddball Double Greed comp with a 6% play rate and a very, very confusing 58% win. When you start diving below the surface though, to understand this 58% win rate, it starts making a ton of sense. The whole premise of this composition is that it's super swingy and subject to extreme individual performances. It's either going to work extraordinarily well and be a one-sided pub stomp, or it's going to absolutely fizzle and still be a one-sided pub stomp, just not in the direction you want it to be. And so what this 58% win rate is, is it's these teams who have very high caliber individual players popping off, winning their way through the group stage, and then falling flat on their faces and losing very abruptly. It's that meme commentary that you hear every once in a while where it worked great until it didn't. Now that we've gone over these top 5 compositions, for those of you that watched the tournament, you know that one that was very high profile is conspicuously missing. That composition is Brimstone, Cypher, Omen, Phoenix, Sova. The Sageless composition pulled out by TSM countless times throughout the tournament, including during the Grand Final. Interestingly, the composition wasn't just played by TSM, it was actually also pulled out by FaZe Clan, meaning that it saw a play rate of 4.5% throughout the entire tournament and saw a 51% win rate overall. I find the whole design of this composition incredibly intriguing. You're running a single self-sufficient entry in Phoenix, you're running two controllers in Brimstone and Omen, and then you're running two Intel agents in Cypher and Sova. The thing that interests me here is what the composition is fundamentally designed to do. It's designed to use its intel assets to play around its smokes. 
While a more standard composition counts a Sage Wall as one of its core assets in a Stall Tactics toolbox, this composition relies entirely on its double controller setup to accomplish the same objectives, with the increased efficacy that they get to reap via having double intel agents giving them a stronger play around and play through of smokes than a standard comp would. Very interestingly, Sageless comps aren't just an NA, TSM, and FaZe Clan thing. If we swing over to EU and the recent Rise of Titans competitions, another Sageless comp made its way all the way to the Grand Final, and that was Breach, Cypher, Omen, Rays, and Sova. This composition was run by Fabrican, the eventual winner of the entire competition, making an almost mirror run of TSM's victory. The most immediately apparent parallels here are the double intel agents in Cypher and Sova, the high flexibility controller in Omen, and the dedicated entry in Breach. The primary divergence obviously being that while in NA's case you're bringing in a second controller in Brimstone, in Fabrican's case they're bringing in Rays. This compositional divergence speaks volumes about a distinction in playstyle between the two teams in two regions. In TSM's case with the second controller, they have access to a lot more smokes to both play coordinated executes as well as play stall when they're on defense. Whereas with Fabrican's Rays, they have a much stronger ability to take the fight to their opponents and play aggressively. If we take a look at how Fabrican did with the composition, they managed to drop a 68.5% win rate. You read that correctly, an almost 70% win rate using this composition. This is incredibly interesting, especially given the fact I think TSM's version of the composition is better. I think that having access to more execute tools is going to be inherently stronger than another aggressive agent 99.99% .99 of the time. And now we're going to get deep into speculation, but this is my read on why Fabrican was so successful with this composition, despite the fact it's honestly, in my opinion, the inferior version of the comp. And that's that Fabrican played this composition the exact opposite way that any sane human would expect. You look at this composition, you see the raise over a second controller, and you say, okay, they have a very aggressive composition, I expect them to lean into their offensive side and win via that skew. In reality, that couldn't be more wrong. In the semi-final and grand final of Rise of Titans, they won through 10 win defensive sides compared to 3 win offensive sides. While playing its normal role of an entry or secondary when they were on offense, when on defense they played the raise like an anti-entry where it was frequently pushing into the enemy. A perfect example of the old adage, the best defense is a strong offense. That all said, I think that this whole playstyle undergoes way more risk than is necessary. To get us back around to TSM, I think their version of the composition can be played in a very similar style and just take less risks while doing it. There's nothing stopping you from playing your Phoenix and your Omen as strong anti-entries. Seeking out and forcing selective contact with the offense team is something that is very doable with the number of smokes and the amount of intelligence that TSM's version of the composition can gather. But I digress. Obviously we got quite a bit away from just the T1X NSG showdown there, but I think Sageless comps were the biggest takeaway from that tournament and the thing that you guys are probably most interested from it. So let me know down in the comments below. What are your thoughts on Sageless compositions? Do you think they're the way forward? I mean, hell, they took a title in EU and in North America within a seven day time frame. You can't ignore that. But does that mean it's the best way to play the game right now? I don't think it necessarily is. I think that a fair amount of this just was born out of the fact that it's not something teams are used to playing against. And honestly, I think teams are not playing Sage remotely to her greatest potential. Interested to hear your guys' thoughts on that. As always, if you're enjoying my content, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll have tons of content coming down the pipeline in the next couple of days as I do the rest of my default victory series, breaking down the defaults from T1 and TSM during the finals of this competition. So make sure you're following if you wanted to see more of that. If you're really enjoying things, you can catch me on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch, all at AndersTV. And with that all said, thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.